we're about to get started. You don't have to do that. Uh, Dave Buck, I'm sure you all know who he is. He's going to be talking to us about teaching small talk at Carleton University, which is uh, something that happened relatively recently for a young man like Dave. Uh, you might know Dave and I from our podcast, Independent Misinterpretations, which I invite you to listen to on a weekly basis. We release on Sunday. And all, most of the sessions, or at least everything that we've recorded here at Stick 13, will be showing up in that stream over the next probably many, many months since we only release once a week and we often do you know real podcasts where we talk about something. So listen to that stream for the conference stuff. Anybody you know that did not was not able to make it, they can pick it up and I'll let Dave take it off. Okay, thank you very much. Um, this talk is about my experiences both learning small talk at Carleton University and teaching small talk uh, from the time that I left Carleton University. Um, I used to think, or I used to wish when I was a kid that I had superpowers. And I've realized over the years that I do have a superpower. I can imagine something and then launch a small talk image and make it happen. And so I, I like to share that joy of being able to create uh, living software, things that actually do interesting and fun and cool things. So I really enjoy teaching. Uh, so uh, this talk is my experiences at Carleton University and teaching small talk afterward. This is Carleton University. Around about 1981, I started studying at Carleton. I actually had a choice. I, I could have gone to a few universities. My choice uh, narr was narrowed down to Carleton and Waterloo, which was a university a little bit west of Toronto. Uh, I chose Carleton for a couple of reasons. One, I had a nice scholarship for Carleton, that helped. Uh, two, Carleton was in my hometown, so I could actually live at home and go to school, which helped. But the biggest issue, or the biggest reason, was that the first year programming course at Waterloo University was using Fortran, and at Carleton was using Pascal. And I thought, if I'm going to go to a first year program I want to use Pascal, that's the cooler language. I don't want to use Fortran, that would be just, uh. So I like the idea of using Pascal in my first year. And looking at the calendar for Carleton University, the courses just sounded really interesting, especially in the later years, third and fourth year. There were courses on artificial intelligence and computer graphics and all sorts of neat stuff that I wanted to get into. This is a picture of the Hertzberg building. That's the uh, building that housed the School of Computer Science. Um, there are four floors visible, but there's actually a fifth one down below. So the fifth floor on the top was a new addition since uh, I went there for my undergrad. Uh, we, we worked on the fourth floor of that building. I have several professors that you might know from the small talk community. Uh, Dave Thomas, uh, Will Lalonde, and John Pugh. I all had as professors at Carleton University. A uh, quick story about Dave Thomas. Uh, he was uh, famous for delivering a course that we call 95204, which was the Fortran and Cobalt course. And Dave felt that if he had to teach Fortran and Cobalt, he was at least going to make it a large system programming course. So <clears throat> this course was about large system programming. For a Fortran assignment, he would say, OK, for your assignment, you have to design a system that will take or be able to input a schematic or some sort of wiring diagram for an electronic circuit and control a robot, virtual robot, we're not going to give you a real robot, but control a robot that will actually wire wrap the circuit, knowing where to go, what connections to make, and ideally routing the wires in a way that's optimal, that, you know, doesn't run all the way there and then all the way back. And uh, you also have to be able to change colors and change wire thicknesses and uh, be able to enter all this and control this robot. So go design your system and that's your first assignment is to submit the design. So we submitted the designs. Then the next assignment was, okay, now go and implement that system. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the specs for the robot just yet. I'll get those to you shortly. But go design the rest of the system and just make sure that you can connect to the robot when you're done. 
So we went off and coded all the stuff in Fortran and spent a few weeks at it, submitted that as an assignment, and uh, he says, oh, well, there's some changes. Um, you have to do this and this and this differently. Go code that, but I still don't have the robot. So I'll give that to you next week. Next week he comes in. Okay, well, good news, I have the specs for the robot. Bad news is it doesn't do all the things that I told you it was going to do. There's actually no way to change color. And there's no way to, uh, to do this and to do that. So, uh, sorry, uh, it sucks, but you have to go change your program and accommodate this limited robot that we have. So, of course, you've implemented your system in a flexible way, correct? <laughs> so you can change it, right? right? Off you go. That was a fun course. <laughs> <laughs> Wilf Lamond, um, I first met him when he taught uh, an abstract data types course. He didn't know it and I didn't know it at the time, but this was sort of the beginnings of object-oriented programming because abstract data types were all about hiding the implementation of a data type inside basically an interface and you communicate with that data type through the interface. So you don't have to know the internals, you just have to know what operations are presented and you go through those operations. And so he was teaching that, he was very adamant that you should never know what the internals are and of course we learned later that that was actually encapsulation. Wolf was also big on compilers. He taught the compiler course. He got me interested in artificial intelligence. Uh, John Pugh taught me the graphics course. I mentioned this to him years afterward, and he said, yeah, he says, you probably know more about graphics now than I ever knew back then, but that's fine. Because I got into computer graphics after university. Back somewhere around 1984 and 1985, I was sitting in one of the labs and I'm sure it was Dave Thomas and Wilf, and I'm not sure who, if John Pugh was there or not, but they were coming in and setting up some hardware on the Sun workstation. They were installing Berkeley Smalltalk 80, and they didn't have enough RAM on that workstation. So they, the workstation, it had one megabyte of RAM, they needed two megabytes, they were gonna go swap a card from another Sun machine into this one, to get it working with two megabytes. It was slow, it was swapping to virtual all the time. So um, I have a picture, but I'm actually gonna show you with a live demo. This is Hobbs. And I have modified it slightly to show you what it felt like running Smalltalk back then. I'm holding down my mouse button, there we are. Restore display. <laughs> this is the kind of speed we saw. Blinding. Blinding fast. And the darn thing is that, I'll show you in a sec here. Yeah. <laughs> well, blinding in 1985. I'm, I'm sure the Xerox systems were a bit faster than this. <laughs> And then when you hover over the window, it pulls it to the front and refreshes it again. Uh -huh. Oh, wonderful. Okay. <laughs> so you have to wait for it, and eventually it will pop up a scroll bar. There is our scroll bar right there, we're finished. So now I can scroll down and wait. <laughs> that was my first experience with Smalltalk 80. And I had uh, of course it was slow, I knew it was slow, but the interface, the system was so dramatically different from anything I'd ever used before, I was immediately captivated by it. I, I wanted to use it. So at the time I was taking uh, an AI course with Wilf, and he was anxious to get students to uh, use this, um, to use Smalltalk as well. So he said, why don't you go do a project in Smalltalk? I said, yeah, well, you know, the Smalltalk, uh, is, uh, isn't Lisp normally the AI language? He says, well, Smalltalk has symbols just like Lisp. It's not that Lisp has, but Smalltalk doesn't have, it's a great AI language. Okay. So I implemented a system that could parse sentences 
Um, the example here is fruit flies like a banana down at the bottom. Uh, it's an ambiguous sentence because if you use the same sentence, time flies like an arrow, flies is a verb and like is a preposition. Um, so fruit flies like a banana, you could parse it as fruit flies like a banana or fruit flies like, with a verb, a banana. You could parse it either way. So my system would identify fruit as a noun. Fly it would identify as either a noun or a verb, depending on the context. Like might be a verb, it might be a preposition. A might be an article, and banana is a noun. And then it starts doing these matches and says, oh look, I have two nouns in a row, that could be a compound noun. And when it finally puts everything together, it finds that it has two sentences for the two different parsings of that tree. And then it says, I have two answers, I don't know which one it is. But at least I've parsed the, uh, the sentence for you, and you have some possible answers. In order to do this, I had to actually learn Smalltalk. I can remember heading off to a building at Carleton University, and sitting down in a quiet room and going through this book, trying to answer the question, what the hell is that semicolon doing? <laughs> <coughs> I, I, could, I could get everything else, but the semicolon threw me. So I finally found the answer. It was, it was in here, and I learned lots of other good stuff from that book. So that was my very first small talk project back in 1985. And that's where I first got my love for small talk. Between, well, after I graduated in 85, I went to work at um, Northern Telecom or Bell Northern Research. And while I was there, one time I visited Carleton again, and everybody was using small talk there. And someone there said, oh, we have, um, we have a, um, the source code for small talk. And I thought, cool, what's it written in? Oh, it's written in C. It's the Berkeley source code. Cool, I need that. So we have, I had them copy it onto floppy disks. It took up something like four floppy disks with the code plus the image plus the, the uh, sources file. I took it home, I modified it, and compiled it for my Amiga. And I actually managed to get Smalltalk 80 running on the Amiga. I think it was the only Smalltalk 80 to ever run on an Amiga. And I promised that I'm going to try and recover that and uh, get it so that I can run it in an Amiga emulator these days. So I'll see what I can do with that. Uh, it ran very slowly because it was all, um, well, the C optimization wasn't really all that good. So in order to make it faster, I went through the core interpreter loop and hand optimized it in 68,000 uh, assembly language. And that was probably the case of the biggest uh, performance boost by doing micro-optimizations that I've ever experienced. Because if I saved myself two cycles, everything sped up so dramatically because the, the loop was running around so quickly. It was it, For interpreting every instruction, it would have to interpret the loop or run the loop once. So every single cycle I could pull out of it was a big performance improvement. I actually created a large virtual screen so I could push my mouse to the side and the whole screen would pan over and I could have windows way over here and way over there even though I only had 640 by 480 resolution on my Mac or my Amiga. So after that I was at a, uh, a meeting of, uh, I think it was a local computer club and Wilt happened to be there. And I mentioned to him that I was uh, planning to come back to Carleton to do a master's program. He says, oh great, he says, you, 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 should, uh, you should do it with me. He says, I'd love to have you as my, I'd like to be your supervisor. And I said, well, that would be great. I, I want to do it in computer animation. Because I'd gotten into computer graphics, I'd written a ray tracing program called DKB Trace that became a program called Pavray, if anybody's heard of Pavray. And that was me. And, um, I was very interested in computer graphics. That was just so cool that I could render graphics. 
So he says, well, you should do that in small talk. So, you know, small talk, it's good, but it's kind of slow for that. Yeah, he says, it's, it'll encourage you to develop fast algorithms. <laughs> I don't have to turn up my Skype. That's not even someone that I know. <laughs> Tell you what, fastest way to do that is just to disconnect from the network. Hello. Here we are. Keep them disconnected. Okay. So yeah, it'll, it'll encourage you to develop faster algorithms if you do it in small time. So I did. So I went to grad school. Here are some of the projects I worked on in small talk. Now I can describe them. I'm trying to recover code for them. That's all in the same Amiga small talk image if I can get to it. Great bird vehicles. This was done for uh, some artificial intelligence research. The idea is you have a vehicle that has two wheels, those are those black bars on the side, and two light sensors in front. And if I put a light source off on the side, then that light source is hitting the right sensor more than it's hitting the left sensor and driving the right sensor. And that drives the left wheel, which turns the car towards the light. And so this becomes a light chaser. So with a very, very simple circuit, I could actually create little behaviors out of these vehicles. I could turn lights on and turn lights off. And these vehicles would run around chasing these lights. And I even put in something that if the vehicle didn't see any lights, then there was one small bias to one of the wheels, so it would slowly turn in circles until it sees a light and runs off to it. So that was cool. And I eventually developed this so it had a neural network driving the car. And that neural network was programmed so that one of, let's ignore enemies for the moment, one of three desires was strongest and either wanted food, water, or shelter. And so if the desire for food outweighed everything else, then the desire for food drove the wheels in the same way as you saw in the previous slide, and it would go running towards food. When it got to food, it would be filled up, its desire would drop down, and something else would now become the dominant desire, and it would spin around in circles, find it, and go running off to it. So again, I thought it was interesting behavior from a simple little neural network. And another AI project there, augmented transition networks to parse sentences in a better way than my initial undergrad project. I did an ELISA clone to act as a psychiatrist and ask you for information about your father. Expert systems, I did forward and backward inferencing. And I love neural networks, I thought that was a cool way to go. And I did a lot of neural network code in small talk. But for the core of my thesis, I wanted to get into computer graphics and animation. So to do that, I implemented a full 3D beast line renderer as a scan line algorithm. Now, this isn't an actual image, but it's very, very similar to what my program would have generated. Uh, I could actually wrap textures on top of that. And it looked pretty cool. And for my final thesis, I implemented computational physics. Computational physics allows me to take some 3D shape and control the control points. In this case, I have a piece of cloth. I'm pulling it up, down, and then up a little bit. And you can see how the cloth follows along. So my thesis was basically that if you're doing computer animation, you want to have these things, um, the various parts of the animated characters controlled automatically by physics. And then the rest of it you control by skeletons that you can use to create the animation. Shortly after that, a few years after I graduated, I joined the Object People. Uh, John Q was the president, and the co-founders were Paul White and Will Fallon. And uh, that was in 1993. From 1993 onward, I've worked almost exclusively in small talk, um, either training or consulting. With, us, with the object people, we would give small talk training courses. So they wanted to get me into the training. So they said, here, why don't you come with us to Toronto? You watch how we train, how we deliver these courses. 
and um, then when you're ready, then you can give your own courses. And that's where I talk about their tag team teaching. That's my term for it. On the first day of the course, Wolf came in. Okay, here's the course. We'll do this, talk about that. And here I'm going to give you a demo. And in this demo, I'm going to do this and do this. And then at the end of the day, Wolf flies out. And the next day, Paul White flies in. And I was amazed that they not only knew the material so well that they could just drop into the course like that, but they also knew how each other taught the course. And so Paul would come in and say, you know, yesterday in Will's demo, he actually talked about this. And he did. And I'm going to elaborate on that, and I'm going to tell you more about this. And that to me was quite amazing, that they, they knew how each other taught the course. At the end of the day, Paul would fly out, John would fly in and give the next day of the course. So it was that kind of teaching style. By that time, they had been given these courses so often that it was second nature to them. What we found, or what I found, was hands-on exercises are critical in these kinds of training courses. Um, it's one thing to talk to a group of students and say, here's how this works. And they're all sitting and nodding and they actually ask intelligent questions. And you think, great, they got it. Go do it. And they do it and they fall flat. We also found that we needed to teach object-oriented programming along with small talk because back at that time, nobody knew about object-oriented programming. I would stand at the back of the room and watch for red screens. I don't know if anybody recognizes this. This is from Digitalk Small Talk. When you get an unhappy exception, the window that pops up is a bright red. We'll see that at the back of the class because we can see all the screens in front of us. And then shortly after, it'll go yellow. And that's the debugger. Good. They need help now. So we'll walk up. So what are you doing? <laughs> What's the problem? Uh, self not understood. Sounds like you're missing a period. And sure enough, they're missing a period. So this is the kind of thing that we would be doing. The very first course I delivered was one that John thought, well, maybe I shouldn't run the course. It's only two students. You know, it's really not worthwhile. But it's a good chance for you to you know, cut your teeth on training. So he sent me to teach the course. I found out by the end of the course, one student was sent to learn visual basic. And this was Visual Works. Um, OK, so you're actually in the wrong course. It was kind of too late to correct that problem. So um, I'm just hoping that you're learning something interesting in this course. The other person was a Fortran programmer. And uh, they wanted to learn something about objects. But they weren't really going to be using small time. What I found here was that um, I had to sit down outside of the regular class structure, sit down with both of them and say, okay, look, here's how it really works. And go through it more slowly, more carefully, and explain better. And at least the Fortran programmer finally said, ah, I get it. Aha! And th that was my first aha moment from one of the students. It's like, that is cool. You, you understand what we're talking about here. I think the other one didn't quite get it, but she really wanted Visual Basic anyway. <laughs> uh, let me do that. Hardest questions. I was teaching a course in, I believe it was in New York somewhere. I had this question. Oh no, this wasn't New York, this was somewhere else. Can you explain this object oriented stuff in terms of input processing and output? Blink, blink. Um, okay, you're a cobalt programmer. Okay, um, well, uh, sort of the parameters are input, no wait, because uh, then the return value, no, no but, but that, you're thinking of input as I.O. and, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Funniest questions. This was from someone who had already taken a class and was playing around with the system, was doing stuff, and he emailed me this question. He gives me a code example where he had a class called junk class. 
and it had a nil superclass. And he thought this was so cool. I, told, I mentioned in the course that you could do this. And he sends me this question. Uh, my jump class inherits from nil, so how can it respond to new? So how can it get the new method? And I knew that he had taken the course and he, he was doing well with it and understood it, so I gave him this answer. Oops, sorry. Back up. I said, the superclass of jump class class is class, so it's inherits its, its new behavior from behavior. <laughs> <laughs> Go parse it out. <laughs> I never heard back from him. <laughs> Thought-provoking questions. Why do you sometimes use colon and sometimes use colon equals? It's confusing. You know, just choose one and use them all the time. Okay, you don't quite get this, do you? How do you do a switch or a case statement? That was pretty common. Where's main? I get that a lot. Where did my collection go? Um, Ron Sharon once answered the question, where's Maine with New England? <laughs> <laughs> this ended up being a common mistake. My collection is order collection, new add hello. And the variable gets assigned hello when they don't get their collection. And then I have to explain that the add operations actually return the thing that you added. And if you want to get the collection itself, you have to cascade in yourself. Oh, you know, use Objective Studio. I'm sorry? Use Objective Studio. In Visual Studio, it works. Okay, it's Objective, Objective, Studio. Objective Studio, I'm sorry. Objective Studio, yes. There are some dialects that have uh, different behavior for that. Use parentheses. <laughs> use parentheses. Um, I actually discovered from Dan's talk this morning uh, the reason that add and app put uh, returning the value that they put is because they were intending to have assignments to more complex things on the left hand side. So they could say this at that is assigned this value. And I always thought that it was done for compatibility with assignment, but I didn't think it was quite that literal. So, best mistakes. This was a course I was giving while I was at Carleton, we had students coming in and uh, uh, we would just teach them things about uh, university life. This one I'm actually going to do because it's more fun that way. So I'll come back to my Hobbes image running here. Uh, but before I do that, I'm going to take out my little thousand factorial that's slowing it down. Otherwise, it's going to drive me batty. Okay, here's it running at normal speed. Um, oh, and I guess it crashed earlier, so hold on a sec. I'm going to relaunch it. Do it. Okay, workspace. I'm going to type form black white. What does this do when you execute it? Form is a class. Used to be the forms that you drew bitmaps with. Black is a class method that returns you the standard black form. White paints it white. Now, unfortunately, form black is what's used to draw black characters and black menus and black anything. And so you sort of can't see what you're doing anymore, but amazingly, the system is still running. <laughs> so I actually spent a few minutes saying, if I can only type in the right code, even though I can't see it, and select the right menu item, even though I can't see it, I can actually recover this. And after a minute of thinking about it, I thought, screw it, kill the image, restart, recover from changes, because it's just too hard doing that. So, but that was fun. <laughs> One another of the, of the best mistakes in, uh, of course, somebody had a name method, but put it as a class me method instead of an instance method, and had to call another instance method. 
It doesn't sound so bad, except that when you get your exception, the exception window wants to print the name of the class, <laughs> which hits this method, it gets another exception, then pops up another exception window, and you start getting exception windows <laughs> faster than you can close them. Uh, that's fun. Favorite small talk sayings I've collected over the years. You can always find yourself useful in small talk. Uh, small talk is so object oriented that nothing is an object. <laughs> I think Alan likes this one. Class classes is a super class about class classes. You've heard that one before? One that I say is, uh, there are three levels of understanding that don't understand. I think this came from someone else. I don't know if it's Kent Beck or not, but it might be. One is, overriding DNU is so cool. Look, you can do that. Wow, that power. Second level of understanding is, it's evil. Don't you ever do that again. <laughs> and the third one is one that Kent Beck wears a t-shirt that says, well, override DNU for <laughs> For today, I'm still delivering small talk training, although, to be honest, the volume is down. I'm getting a couple courses a year, but not terribly much. Um, I'm trying to offer webcast courses because one of my problems is I get requests from various companies for training, but I can't bring them all here to Ottawa, or I can't go to three separate places. So if I offer it over the internet, it actually works and it allows me to deliver courses to multiple people. And I'm trying to deliver, or trying to develop self-paced courses that are recorded video. Uh, there are some technical problems of, I'm just not very good at creating and editing video. And I'm actually not very good at um, getting a video correct the first time. It just sounds weird when I when I start saying something and I pause or I say the wrong words and then I have to go cut it up, it's just the editing is very difficult. So it's much more difficult than I thought. And uh, also when I start recording and an airplane flies by and I have to pause my recording, it sort of throws everything off. So I'm still working on it, but uh, I'm trying to get those uh, courses uh, recorded and produced. And that is basically my presentation. Are there any questions? Yeah, Dave. Try projecting your audience onto the wall while you're talking to them. Projecting an audience onto the wall, yeah. Um, it's much, it's much, much easier. So just take a photo of any audience? Well, you can do that, or if you're doing one course, you do doing, yeah. the, even if you're only one or two people, you at least have someone you're talking to. It's like going on a stage where you have stage lights. It's the same, same problem. You, you know, most technical people look at the audience for the feedback, right? So, and it's an interesting so, so what you do is just take their, just take two monitors and keep one of them to you know, to put a projector in the room and project the audience on the wall. You countries. actually can you can you can stay with them quite a bit longer. We've done this for projecting uh, you know things from user groups or Yao. Yeah. We projected Rich Hickey simultaneously to two sites in Australia from the U.S. and he said you know, I can stand this because I can see them. Yeah. I find it very disconcerting to stand up talking to nobody as if there was somebody there. And you think, psychologically, you think that's not a big problem. I can pretend there are people there. No, you can't. It's, it's a different kind of feel. You could just try being a narcissist who loves the sound of his own voice, too. I have a hard time with that. <laughs> <laughs> I can give you lessons. He <laughs> doesn't have to practice either. Other questions? Thank you very much.